Hi, good afternoon. Apologize for the delays. This is Amanda Marino, co-founder of Next Level Recovery Associates. I am here with Nicole McLaurin, who is a registered dietitian. I'm so grateful to have you here today with me live. Thank you, you could introduce yourself, Nicole, and just share a little bit about who you are and your background. Of course, yeah. Um, my name is Nicole McLaurin. I have been a registered dietitian for oh gosh, since 2014, I think now. So um, it's been a while. I went to Florida State University. I got my undergrad in dietetics. Um, I completed an internship with the Palm Beach County Health Department, um, which is kind of how I got started. I was working in public health and um, actually really enjoyed it. I really liked helping people in need, but um, I needed a little more uh, freedom to give different counseling, meet different people. And I got into substance abuse. And since then kind of have been with that since about 2017, um, started working more with mental health, started working more with eating disorders. And now I kind of do a mix of all three. Cause as you know, most of you probably know it's, it's hard to find, you know, just mental health or just substance abuse. Cause they're all really, um, equivalent together. Um, yeah, it's so needed what you do and there's not enough, you know, like there's, there's a lot of dietitian or just registered dietitians out there, um, you know, but not that have the skill set that you have, which is the combination of understanding eating disorders and understanding mental health and understanding substance use disorder, because nutrition plays a huge part into everything that we do. Right. Um, so I don't I don't know if you know, my undergrad is an alternative medicine, which which had a oh, huge no. which had a huge focus on nutrition and a lot of holistic nutrition. Um, and all the different, like, you know, Eastern kind of teachings and then also like the, the traditional teachings. But so, I mean, so many things can be healed, cured, um, can be, you know, symptoms of mental health and, and things like that can be shifted. And, and a huge, sometimes it's just about changing your diet um, it can be a huge piece. So I'd love to, you know ask you your experience on that, like working with individuals that come into, you know, a program or come to you with a, a mental health concern or, or substance use disorder or eating disorder and how, you know, your work is impactful in their life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you hit the nail on the head when you said nutrition is really at the foundation. Um, I feel like if we're not eating and fueling our bodies and, um, you know, with enough calories and the right nutrients and, um, you know, listening to what our physical hunger is, but also like mentally, like, you know, what do we need? Like, what kind of day are we having? Um, we can't be successful with recovery. Um, we can't, you know, accomplish all these things, have the energy, have the focus that we really need. Um, I think one of my favorite things is meeting someone who is, um, just so thrown off with their eating because of a million different reasons. Um, you know, they were using substances for a long time and are just started treatment or their mental health has really just, you know, been in the pits and like, they really need help. They really need more structuring. And, you know, we do something as simple as, okay, you know, we're going to eat three times a day. We're going to eat breakfast. We're going to eat lunch. We're going to eat dinner and maybe one or two snacks, depending on where we are. And usually they think I'm nuts because that's not, they haven't had any structure in their life in so long. Um, but sometimes when I see them in a week and they're like, you know, I may not have eaten, you know, I only ate four times yesterday, but I like wasn't totally exhausted at, you know, 3 PM. And it's so, it's so nice to see those changes happen really, really quickly. Um, and a lot of times it's just something really simple and really small, like changing a breakfast versus like a, you know, a sugary cereal with milk to, you know, and egg, eggs on an English muffin with a slice of cheese and some strawberries. I mean, it's, it doesn't have to be crazy, difficult meals, but it's these little tiny switches that we can do and see pretty quick feedback um, and changes, which is nice. That actually leads me to my next thing. I think, um, you know, I know how you, you how you operate. We've, we've worked, so Nicole and I have worked collaboratively together for probably about two years now. And really more officially, like in the last like six months, we finally met in person. We had actually worked with a number of clients together for years before we had met in person. So it was so awesome to meet you in person. Um, but I think that like, you know, I, I had my own stuff, you know, in about nine years in recovery that came up around food and body, like that I had never had in my life. And I really did some research into this whole diet culture thing. 
So I think with what's out there, especially for like, you know, young people, especially like what's out there with diet culture. Like when you think, okay, I want to get healthy and I want to, you know, eat better. You don't even know where to begin. Right. Because there is a zillion quick fixes out there. There's a zillion kinds of fad diets and all of these things that keep people on this screwed up roller coaster. And like when that's why when I, I like to bring you in because you simplify it and you, you educate people on how to eat healthy that's best for your body and how to listen to your body. And I know you're big with the intuitive piece. So I'd love to hear more on that. Yes. Um, no, I love that you bring up diet culture because um, it's so true. I mean, if it, I actually, it's it's sad, really. I mean, there's so much information out there. Um, the word wellness, um, which is really funny because I think wellness used to actually have a really strong, you know, it was talking about, you know, eating, you know, nutritive foods and, you know, getting some sort of physical activity. But now I've seen wellness really shifted to a lot of different things, you know, um, I see so many diet phrases hitting social media and it's um, cringeworthy, um, you know, the keto, the intermittent fasting, um, which just to say it, you know, for some people, if they like eating that way and they're not having another set of problems, I'm not going to tell anyone that they're doing something inherently wrong if they feel good and, you know, they're actually listening to their body. Um, it's working for them and they're not going on a this, which exactly. is what America is doing <laughs> It's like gaining, losing, and on fat. And that's really most, and it's really hard for people with addiction, mental illness, and eating disorders when they're yes. doing that. It's, it's and, just spirals. And that's the issue is that, you know, especially with mental health, like, you know, we want our mood stable. We want everything stable. We don't want to be up here in mania. And we don't want to be down here where, you know, we don't want to get out of bed. So we want to stay in the middle. And if our blood sugar is crashing because we haven't had carbs or our eating window hasn't started yet and we haven't eaten in 14 hours, um, no one feels good here. But when we have a substance abuse history, um, you know, substances can sometimes look pretty good because our body's looking for that dopamine response when we're this low. Um, there's actually a lot of great studies on this, which I try to use when I have someone a little more resistant to making changes. Um, we need those carbs to bring us up and keep us here. And on the flip side of that, of course, if we're, you know, having a lot of sugar cravings and are we're way up here because of that, that's not really a good place to be either. So we do need that balance, um, which is kind of where intuitive eating comes into play. Um, and just for sake of saying it to intuitive eating, sometimes if we, I get someone with a really strong eating disorder, that's like, oh, I'm not hungry. I'm not feeling any hunger cues. I don't need to eat at these times. We may not be ready to start there, um, yes. but I do really like intuitive eating once we've made some progress. But yeah, that was really uh, designed by two dietitians um, years ago. And unfortunately, it wasn't something I was taught in school either. Um, I had never heard of it until I got into this space and started researching you know, good approaches. But intuitive eating is 10 principles. Um, the first one is ditching the diet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's my favorite one, um, shocker, because I think it's, you know, it's really an eye-opening one. Can you say that one again? I'm sorry. I spoke over you asking you to say it. So sorry. <laughs> so to go through all of that. That's okay. Uh, ditching uh, the diet mentality is the first one. Um, not having them in front of me is working with my brain, but I can list most of them. Um, honoring your hunger. So like listening to those like hunger cues, um, respecting your fullness cues. Um Tuning out the food police, which I think is another really big one, because with all of this culture of, you know, low carb or this is a good food, this is a bad food, we can I feel judged. That. Yes. Good and bad. I know. That's I like. Know. Yeah, we don't, we don't, we have a very healthy discussion system in my house. We don't call foods good or bad. We don't say things like that. Like, I don't allow that. We don't talk about yeah. diets. Yeah. I think it's, it's not, food can't be good or bad. You know what I mean? Like, and it's. Just you know, if we're having, you know, if we're having a celebration and we want pizza and ice cream cake, like that's the celebration. That's the meal. If you're ready for that and you feel comfortable eating that, that's awesome. And that doesn't mean we were bad tonight, right? Like, no. like label we're let's go, let's go be bad and have pizza and cake. Like, I don't want that attachment in my, for my kids, you know, like, I don't want them to relate that. I want them to focus on making sure they eat the nutritious foods that they need in their body, but also be able to enjoy fun in life. Exactly. Because if we're cutting all of that out and ignoring it, um, typically, you know, eating can be like a pendulum. Like if we're restricting, restricting, restricting and or the, restricting the types of food even. And then we're presented with a pizza and that's our thing. 
we're probably going to eat a whole pizza or most of it because we had that pendulum has to swing the other direction. Um, but yes, I, that's where I love intuitive eating because it does teach us that these are not bad things to eat. Um, but it does, the, I think it's, I believe it's principle um, 10, that's general nutrition, the last one that's saying, that is also mindful that we do need foods that contain these good nutrients because we can't just eat, you know, every piece of junk food and not have anything else. Um, Empty calories. <laughs> exactly. Right. I think they, I think the book refers to them as fun foods. Um but yeah, there's there's different things. Um, Intuitive Eating, yeah, that is a great book. Um, it's, what is it? Elise Reich is one of the authors. Um, it's a good one. You can listen to it too. There is a workbook that goes with it, which a lot of my, um, I do have a lot of my clients buy it. But um, it's really good. At, and it also looks at body image, which is huge. Um, body image, I kind of, you know, it's a therapy and a nutrition piece. But, um, you know, respecting our body at every size and every stage of life. I mean, there's so many things that happen to us. I mean, if you're in recovery, you know, and you put on a few pounds, like you have to look at this overall picture of, okay, maybe my weight has changed slightly, but I'm not using, you know, I've cut alcohol out, I've cut substances out. Like that's a huge win. Um, yeah. And that's common. So that's, that's very common is to go, you know, into early recovery, whether you go into a residential sitting or you, you know, you get sober on your own or clean on your own, you know, sugar, you're feel, you know, that alcohol void gets filled with sugar because alcohol is metabolized like as sugar. So many people are become sugar addicted. And I know when I came into recovery, I was already extremely overweight. Um, so I kind of was like the opposite. So I started like my health and, you know, healthy journey, you know, when I got sober, I, you know, lost all like all the weight just by eating healthy and exercising slowly over the first couple of years. But I was opposite. I, I did things backwards than most people do it, but it makes sense. Like, can you, can you speak a little to why the people that are in early recovery or in recovery become like really hooked on sugar? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot with that. And I, I do like, though, that you point out that, you know, not everyone has the same experience. And I, I do feel like I, I work in a lot of residential settings and I'll have someone that's their first time and they're terrified of gaining weight because that's all everyone has told them. Uh, right. Oh, when you get sober, you're going to oh, just pack on the pounds. And it's really sad. I've actually met a lot of um, clients who they, one of one of the barriers, of course, there's many to them actually, you know, committing to recovery was that they didn't want to gain weight. Um, but I always, you know, make sure that that is not just like this blanket thing that's going to happen. A lot of times, yes, if you're, you know, not eating well because you're, you know, drinking a lot or not in your right state of mind, then yes, like your eating style could absolutely change. But with sugar cravings, typically that happens because of the dopamine response. Um, when we're using or drinking, you know, we're getting all those feel good um, endorphins, feel good hormones. And then all of a sudden we take it away and our body's like, you know, what the heck? Like, where did all that go? Like, give me something. And in treatment, typically we have a lot of good food, um, which for the record, at least anywhere I work, we do not supply this food so that, you know, I don't know, I've heard it all. <laughs> so that everyone's full or like carb heavy. No, we're just cooking food. And typically, you know, people want food that's going to like fill them up, make them feel good. And that's, that's what we get. But um yeah, it's a real chemical response, though. So it isn't surprising if someone's craving sugar or just carbohydrates. You know, so that might look like French fries or cereal. Or it doesn't come in the sweets. It comes in the salt, the like the fries and the chips and the this and that. I hear both, you know, uh, but, you know, it is like I, I feel, you know, I remember when I was like at the beginning early on in my recovery journey and I was like on like I wanted to not just be, you know, sober and clean. Like I wanted to start to take care of my body. I had really high cholesterol when I was like I was 220 pounds. So I had super high cholesterol. I was not healthy. I wanted to get healthy and I would like kind of look around and it'd be like, well, why aren't we why aren't more people like also focusing on health? Like, yes, getting clean and sober is the most important piece, but like. I want to now like take care of the body that I abused. Like I beat the hell out of my body and my partying and my, what I, what I call partying and my addiction. Um, and I wanted to get healthy again, you know what I mean? And now I'm 42 and I look younger than I did when I was 26. <laughs> I'll send you, I'll send you a picture. I know I had to, I didn't know all this. I mean, I knew, I knew you were in recovery, but I had no idea that um, you had that bit large of a shift. Um, yeah. I went from being like, 
a model as a from ages four to 22. So having like a like that, you know, never had to work out perfect kind of little then I got extremely overweight to where like I was considered obese and had high cholesterol and was extremely unhealthy um, by the time I got sober. Um, and, you know, have been on this, you know, health journey, you know, educating myself, and I've learned so much, um, you know, with myself, with my clients, with my schooling. Um, hold on one second. I have, I have, we have some questions. So if you're here and you want to say hello to myself or Nicole, please say hello. If you have any questions for Nicole, she is a registered dietitian. She does have a lot of experience with mental health eating disorder and individuals with substance use disorder, which is such a great skill set. So I have a hello. I am overweight and hardly lose some kilograms. I'm not addicted to food, but I don't like the gym or walking. How can I motivate myself? Motivating yourself. Okay. That's a great question. Um, Quick, sorry. Hold on. Go you can answer. Okay. Um, Motivation is definitely different for every person, but what I typically do for a patient that's struggling with um, getting things going is finding your why. Whatever your why is for anything, life, if, if you're in recovery, so your why might be the same. You know, if you want to be sober or, um, you know, be stable and present for your family, I mean, health is right there with you. Like, if, if we're not taking care of our bodies now, who knows what kind of complications we're going to run into in the future. Um, my other biggest thing is making, having consistency. Consistency is key for all of us. Um, whatever routine you can make with your food, with your eating is, I definitely think is helpful. Even if it's one meal a day, if you change one meal, you know, if you're having, you feel like you're having large portions at one meal or something really star starchy or high calorie, like make one change um, in your day and just see how you feel from that. Sometimes getting that good feeling with one meal or one small change can motivate us to make a lot more changes. As far as activity, yes. Um, I am a firm believer, and everyone may not believe this, but we all have an activity out there that we love. Kind of like life, right? There's I, was the thing, I was thinking the same thing, reading. Like, I was, this, yeah, along the same yeah, line. We, we all have something. And I under, for, it's certainly not the same. I know right now, like, there's a lot of these hit, this high intensive um, interval training that's really popular. And that is not for everybody. But um, my encouragement is, like, don't be shy. Like, try a yoga class. Like, or try yoga at home. Or go for a long walk. Um try a water aerobics class. I mean, do different things that might seem like you're like, wow, I can't believe I'm doing this. Um, I have a client recently who Amanda knows, I'll tell her later, that is to me, it seems super shy, super timid, super like, I mean, she talks so softly. When I first met her, I would have to like lean this close to her to hear. And she just told me the other day that she really enjoys Zumba classes. I was so shocked because I've been working with her for a while. I'm like, you do Zumba. Like, you will go to a class. And to me, that sounds super intimidating. And I would yeah. not. There's so much out there. So, like, I wanted to. So, like, you, you, may, you may think. So, I would not. I also wouldn't focus on, like, numbers and weight loss. Like, I don't, folk, I don't worry about that. So, for the woman that's asking, I think that, like, focusing on just moving your body and, and try different things. Right? So, don't focus on a number because that will just mess your head up. At least it has for me. Just trying to focus on like, like even Nicole said, changing one meal a day to a healthier meal. And, um, you know, like that has a ba it's balanced nutrition and then moving your body because like whether we don't like to go to the gym or we don't like to walk, we movement keeps the body healthy. We're not meant to be sedentary. We're not meant to be, you know, not move. And that's how, our, if you don't move it, you lose it too. You know, with old people that get older, you see these older people running half marathons and things like that. And you see these, these healthy older individuals that are able to do things into their eighties, nineties, you know, and, and I want that. It's amazing. So I want us to remain healthy and not about, you know, numbers on a scale. Great. I agree. What are your thoughts on numbers? Let's talk about numbers. Let's talk about people getting fixated on calories. Uh, mm -hmm. Blake's here, so say hello to Blake. Hi, Blake. And I have we have a friend from Ghana on here. I was actually supposed to come to Ghana, um, but then the pandemic came. I was supposed to come speak at a women's women's world global conference out there, so I missed out oh on that. Goodness. So maybe I'll get to Ghana. 
But let's talk about numbers, um, numbers on the scale, numbers of calories, yeah. macros. Let's let's hear our, our experience on that, Nicole. Oh, man, I do not love numbers for so many reasons. Um, I'll start with macros. A um, little bit about me. I used to be super into CrossFit. Um, I did a lot of sports in high school and didn't do as many in college. But um, when I graduated, I, I got right into CrossFit and macros were huge. Everyone yeah. talked macros and everyone wanted my opinion because I was the, you know, the dietitian. Um, I hate numbers. I remember thinking that like, oh, they must have like this great calculation, this great way of knowing what each individual person needs. And then they don't. There's online calculators and um I have equations that I have to use for facilities to, you know, have someone's calories in there, you know, for when we get cited by, you know, a government agency or something like that. But I don't even, I don't look at them. They're just there to, to be there. Um, numbers really have no meaning. There's no way to know how much your body actually needs, um, in my opinion, at least. Um, it all depends on your exercise, your, your activity, I shouldn't say exercise, your physical activity levels. Um, a lot of it is also genetic. It's cultural. Um, which I know people hate hearing, but um, it's true. Like we all have a different like um, basal metabolic rate. You might've heard BMR, resting metabolic rate, RMR, and we all burn at different levels. Absolutely. So some of us burn more just at sitting at rest than others do. And like, yeah, it can suck if you're struggling with, you know, your weight and you want to make changes. But um, there's a really cool video on YouTube called Poodle Science. Um, I encourage everyone to watch it. It's about dogs and dog breeds and how, you know, we see a Doberman puncher, we see a bulldog, or we see a greyhound. Or Yorkie. Or Yorkie. Perfect. You know, <laughs> her, you know, Amanda's not upset that her Yorkie is tiny and fits in her hands. Um, and I, we can all accept that or, or a shih tzu? Okay. Or a shih tzu is that size. But then, you know, when we're looking at our bodies, we get really upset. You know, I want to be a greyhound or I want to be a Yorkie, but maybe we're a bulldog or maybe we're um, pitbull. That's my not me. A pitbull or another really large animal that like we don't want to be, but that's our genetics. It is. So, and I'm not saying we can't all make changes. Of course, there's always leeway, but that's some, that's another reason why I really don't like calorie counting and numbers, weight, weight on a scale. Um, can you put the link after this live? Cause it will be streaming. Can you sure. come on to LinkedIn and put the link for the intuitive book and, intuitive. and the, the pool video? Yes. Okay. I will put those on. Um, uh, numbers on the scale. Scale numbers are silly. And in fact, if you've ever met someone with a true eating disorder that's in recovery and they've been to they, they might have tricks for showing you how you can make skill numbers look different. Um, water, water weight, fluids affect weight so much. Um, weight is something that I think we're taught, you know, has all this meaning and all this. And really, it's just literally, you know, what our body mass weighs. That includes our bones, our organs. Um, weight is, is so meaningless in my mind. Um, lean body mass has so much more meaning. I mean, if you're, you know, doing some sort of resistance training, whether it's with weights or bands or whatever it is that you're doing, that's going to have more weight, um, way more on a scale than someone who's sedentary could actually be pretty unhealthy. I don't like using that term, but you know, not, not moving their body, like sitting a lot. Um, it also doesn't tell us anything about our mental state. You know, someone could be at this great weight, but they could be mentally like super unhealthy, like emotionally, like a mess. And we might look at them and think like, wow, I would love to look like them. But in reality, like you don't want to go. That's that. Yeah. I mean, I know that my experience with, so I, I don't know what I weigh. I haven't known what I've weighed for about two years. Plus i if I go to the doctor, I just don't, it's just, for me, it's not a helpful tool of information. Um, and when I, my dad was a fitness competitor and he passed away when I was pregnant with my daughter. So I was like, I want to honor my dad and like do a fitness show. And that's what triggered my body image issues was counting the things and being really strict and rigid. And like, I thought like once I got to this, I, I always felt like once I got to this place with my body after being so overweight that like I would have arrived and this, I would have this happiness. And I was actually the most miserable when I was in the leanest, most, best shape of my life because I, I, it didn't feel right to me. It didn't feel good. And so I had to make a bunch of changes in my life to where like, I can't subscribe to any kind of like fad diet. I can't do any kind of like, I can't, I just, for me, it's how I feel 
what, what things feel like on my body, how, you know, and I'd like to be active just because it feels good. You know, I would do things that feel good. And that's the best thing. I mean, if, if you, you know, knowing that seeing that number is so, you know, this objective label that doesn't do much for most of us. Um, again, even if you, you see someone that you think like, Oh, they probably love looking at their weight. They probably don't. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't think anyone I know really is a fan, I mean, a fan of it. I mean, I, it's just like, and I'm, I'm big, like I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm a, I have big bones. I'm muscular. Like I'm, I'm, I'm so for me, like 150 pounds is like extremely lean on me. Whereas 150 pounds and somebody would be like massive, you know? And that's um, a great example. And height. That's another reason why I cannot stand weight. And I, I, this can go for men too. I certainly don't mean to leave men out, but I think for women, um, height really throws off. I mean, someone that's, you know, over five, five or five, six for a woman is typically considered tall. And, you know, but when they look at a scale, they don't always see that they hear their friends talking, you know, these low numbers and they're like, I would never get there. So I think that's like the ditch the scale. I know at the one eating disorder walk, like you smash scales and like, mm -hmm. that was such a fun exercise. So I say ditch the scale, but Blake has a question for you, which right. is from a male and coming from a different perspective. So as someone who's very active and trying to put on on clean weight, I don't know what that clean weight is, but also hates cooking at home. Do you have any suggestions to ensure I'm getting enough calories, macros, protein, et cetera? Yes. Um, hates cooking. I'm right there with you, Blake. Um, I'm probably, I feel like when I was meeting dietitians fresh out of college, they were all like very into cooking and doing all these things. And I, um, I've never really enjoyed cooking. I've learned to feed my family, but, um, it's not something that I, <laughs> it's not something that I'm super passionate about. Um, so I understand that. Um, I'm not home and like it's like at someone else's house and it's vacation. Like when I go to my aunt's house in LA, I'm down with cooking and, and enjoying it as like a fun activity. But when it's home, it, it's it's not the same for me. It's yeah, it's almost thing. like the pressure to have to do it. Um, yes, lots of things. Um, making sure you're eating enough. Definitely the frequency. I mean, typically if you're trying to put on size, I mean, you need to be eating. I typically tell people every like three to four hours max, but if you're trying to add size, it might even be every like two to three. Um, and getting in those okay, nutrient dense carbohydrates. So like your oatmeal, your sweet potatoes um, or white potatoes, it's really just like a fiber vitamin thing rice, like getting those things in um, is really helpful because typically it's easier to get those carbs in than like tons of fat or even tons of protein because those um, increase satiety. So it makes us full sooner and protein keeps us full for a lot longer. While you still need those, it's easier to jam those carbs in. Um, liquid calories are also really helpful. So like smoothies or um, there are some pre-made shakes. It depends on what you like, but like Orgain has one that I think is pretty good. It's more plant-based. Um, truthfully, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of newer ones that I'm not as familiar with, but um, looking for some carbs, looking for some protein is a good option. Um, so frequency and more carbs and protein. Frequency, more carbs and protein. And also, I don't know how open you are to meal delivery programs, but I'm a huge advocate for those. Um, and not necessarily like home chef or those where they send you the ingredients in a box. Those are great. Nothing wrong with those, but that's still cooking. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, done, I've done a number of the meal delivery services and then I get sick of like just the same things. Um, and then sometimes for me, it's too much. Uh, but you know, he said, Oh, I'm drink Blake said he's drinking an organ right now. Oh, per okay. Great. We're on the same page. Yes. Um, I really like those. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be afraid to look into those meal, even if you only did it for lunches or only for breakfast or something like that. Um, but I think like having those like prepackaged meals where it has like some vegetables, some good carbs and some protein, um, like, you know, you're getting, you know, you're getting a good mix. Um, I know there's tons in the area, but anyway, sounds like you're off to a good start. He also said, he said, ha ha. Yeah. We had hello fresh, but we canceled it because we hated cooking. <laughs> I, you know, I totally get this. It's so funny. My, my husband actually really likes cooking, but he works insane hours. So he's never here to do it. And I absolutely don't like cooking. Um, so it, it's funny how that is, but, uh, I like to bake though. If that's any consolation, I feel like I need something. For that, Baking's but. fun. I like baking with the, the kids, you know? Yeah, exactly. There's more reward with baking or something. I don't know. Um, okay. So we, so ditch the scale. 
don't worry. Like what it's okay. We, we both have worked with people that are really fixated on the calories. I know we touched on that, but like, what, can you just kind of like explain a little bit more about calories? We did macros. We talked about the scale, but like the calorie thing, I think we, yeah, like actually calorie counting, which you're right is huge. I mean, looking at a food label, um, and like just tracking the calories, just looking at that calories are really just energy, energy for our body. So if your body is telling you, you know, you ate a meal and it was 300 calories, let's just say someone that, you know, was trying to eat something small, but you're still hungry. Okay. Like, so, so what does that mean? You know, where are you with that? Like if you designate your calories for all these meals, like, are you going to allow yourself to eat something else? It becomes this really weird control game, um, especially in the mental health, substance abuse, of course, eating disorder frame, um, you know, diets can become really addicting, like all this My Fitness Pal and all these other calorie and macro trackers. Um, it can be another way of just addiction. And I've actually met a few people who, what? I'm sorry. I've done all of them. Yep. I'll be honest. I did. I did all the things. It's the true. It's, I mean, it's, it's this form of control, right? If we're looking for control and we're cutting other things out of our life that were negative, um, it's also easier to normalize calorie counting and really eating disorders or disordered eating in general. Like when it's about food, you can tell people, oh, I'm doing it for my health. Like it's health, it's wellness, it's all these good things. But if we're, you know, trying to eat this small number of calories or which I see a lot too, people will tell me, well, you know, it's dinner and I only have like, you know, 10 grams of protein left and like, you know, 20 grams of carbs and basically no fat or something. I'm like, okay, well, that's, like, do you think this is working? Um, because you're then you're clearly not eating enough. But yeah, being fixated on numbers uh, with calorie counting and again, tracking all these things is a kind of a gateway to eating disorders. There's actually a lot of good articles on that. People that really weren't doing it because of body image, like I think a lot of times we think eating disorder, oh, they must just have done it because they want to lose weight or they want to be skinnier. But it's not always that. Sometimes people kind of fall into it. They're like, well, I used to drink all the time. So now I go to the gym three times a day and now I'm tracking my calories and tracking this. And I've done it all. I, have. <laughs> so pretty slow. I promise you, I did it all. And I, then when I real, then I found like the, the hashtag diet culture, hashtag F diet culture. And then mm -hmm. when I started finding all this stuff out there, I got really angry. I got angry for young women, young men being there's men. Cause I have, I have a friend that's starting a whole coaching practice. I think introduced to, yes. you know, surrounding men with body image issues. I never had this as growing up. I never had body image, eating disorder, any of that stuff. And in diet culture, I got sucked into this whole thing and I got pretty angry for my little girl, for my kids, for, for the clients I work with that, like this multi-billion dollar industry is like, is targeting us to have disordered eating and have body image issues and have mm. viral eating disorders that necessarily weren't there. Cause I couldn't identify, um, with like people that were like, Oh, well, I've had it since I was a kid. It was my first core thing. And I'm like nine years, I was nine years in recovery at the time. And that's when I started to have my stuff. And I was like, well, where's this coming from? This is like new for me. And it's cause I fell into that, into it. I got sucked in. And of course I had some part in it. I'm not saying like, you know, I, I, I made choices, but I'm so much happier now, just like eating what I want and doing what I want and, you know, just taking care of myself and exercising and, and it's happy in me. No, I love that you bring up the anger. Um, I can't remember the book I read, but there's a book about this, um, that kind of like the stages of it. I mean, anger. Yeah. I mean, especially people who've thrown money at like diets or something like Weight Watchers or these things that they were always taught was so great. And then they're learning about, you know, the sick, you know, cycle, the sick spiral of what this is. It is, it's so, it can make you so angry. Um, and yeah, talking about like the next generations, I think it's even harder because social media and all these platforms, like I, I can't even keep up with them about, you know, what kind of body image we're throwing out, what's the new um, dieting phase, uh, all of these videos and images, um, you know, people feel like they just have to look a certain way all the time. Um, wow. It's really tricky. It's a really tricky way to navigate. Uh, one of the biggest things I always tell my eating disorder patients is that no one is born with an eating disorder. It is something that we are learned learn from our environment. There is some research showing a genetic trait, but right. But, but also, you know, are you learning it because at home, that's how mom and or dad were with food and eating? Like, I don't know. 
Um, yeah, we have to be careful as parents, like, you know, if we are like doing something, like say we're doing a challenge or like, you know, something, whatever it is, or we have to be really careful with how we model and say it to our children. Like my ex, my daughter got on the scale at, at Publix and she just, she, she's still young and thinks it's fine and whatever. And her dad's reaction was, wow, you're so big, but she's now a tween. So in her head, she heard that means that I'm too big. And so I had to remind her dad, like, you're dealing with a, a young girl who's going through puberty. You cannot say things about, it, like, it used to be cute. Oh, you're getting so big. That's not cute anymore. You have to be like, oh, that's awesome. You're so healthy and strong and, you know, whatever. Like, you know, kids just like to go on the scale and they go in public. It's just a thing. It's, you know? it's so true. Uh, yeah. I mean, and it changes quickly. Um, my kids yeah. are still super young, but you know, even now they'll, you know, they'll ask like, why do people weigh themselves? And that's sometimes a hard question for me to answer. I'm like, well, you know, there's a lot of different reasons you can weigh yourself, but it makes me think, I'm like, well, how do I want them to perceive weight and scales? And it's funny you bring up Publix. I actually read something recently. They're talking about doing away with the scales inside the grocery stores. It's a shame. Um, filter it's like well, oh, i don't think it's for that it's something about the people that are making the scales um i i was something like they're discontinuing them or something so i think it's more of like they don't have anyone to maintain them but oh, um, people because i just i mean it's cute when you're like a little kid and, oh i'm 30 pounds oh. you know but when <laughs> i'm watching my daughter now like and i'm trying to protect her and educate her on like you know on all these things that like you know and it just I, it just is, I don't want her to, I don't want her to go down that hole. I see so many young girls go down, you know, you're like, right. Perfect and beautiful. And, and you're you know, muscular and you're in shape and you're healthy and you're athletic. And, you know, I try not to use like just certain adjectives with praising children too. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you're smart, you're creative, you know, there's so many other ways we can compliment besides not just uh, physical beauty. Yeah. That's huge. That's a really big one. And I actually, I've had to um, do some like, uh, continuing education on that because I don't feel like we're really taught that we're, you know, like how do you compliment someone without talking about their appearance? And I do think I've gotten better at it, but it's, it's hard. It, it wasn't normal. You know, it was like, Oh, like you look nice today. And like, Oh, wow. Like I, you know, right off the bat said something about someone's appearance and, and that can be hard, especially in treatment. You know, if you tell someone, Oh, you look nice today, they'll think that as, did I gain weight? Do I look different? Um, which I have been challenged on before. And, you know, I had to really work on that language. So it's interesting how much I've had to really change just very little things about myself and the way I talk, um, thinking, wow, I didn't mean it anything like that. But um, yeah, my daughter's dad purely did not mean and when I shared it with him, what it did for her, he was like, Oh, my God, I can't believe it. And he goes, and I just told her that I used to be so overweight. And all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, we just have, it's, we're in a different phase now. You know what I mean? We have to just be really careful with what we, how, and what we say to her because she's not a, a baby anymore. She's like, you know, she's turning into a tween and we have to like, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there that targets girls her age to make them sick. It's so, yeah, it's so true. I mean, we, there's so many things from the clothing to the expectations of, um, I don't know, styles and different things that I, I just, it, it's a different world. Um, but back to the scales on public, I, I do think not just Publix, but anywhere there's like a place where you can weigh yourself. I mean, I see so many people that in treatment don't weigh themselves because they don't have access to a scale, but the second they leave, they go, they will go to public sometimes and weigh themselves. I mean, it's crazy how that can be an addiction in and of itself. It's just seeing that number and getting on that scale. Um, Yes, I wish there was definitely more that we could, you know, as a culture do to just, you know, say we don't need these scales. Like, it's one having... metric. It's one metric of your body. And it's one that she can change like 10 times in a day. You know, mm -hmm. I remember with me, the reason I stopped, I, the reason I ditched the scale was because if I would go on the scale and I would be a lower number, I would be like, oh, cool. I can eat a bunch of shit today. <laughs> And then if I was a higher number, then I'd feel bad about myself and shame myself. But sometimes as a, as a woman, our weight can fluctuate so much in one week yes. with hormones and all the things. So like I said, it was just, it was just a mind game that like, I decided to step off that, that merry go round, you know? Um, and when I tell like people would, you know, like, Oh, how, I'm, my goal is to lose 20 pounds. I'm like, well, it's awesome to have a goal, but like, I'd say just your goal is, you know, how you feel and your clothes and how how your, your energy level and like 
you know, what you're able to do. If you weren't able to walk very far, if you're able to walk like around like further thing now, like that's awesome. That's progress. Like all those things are progress, not just your unit count on a scale. Yeah. I mean, that's great. When you really step back and look at it, you know, something I try to ask a lot of people that are so fixated on their weight is, you know, okay, let's just say you woke up tomorrow, 20 pounds lighter. Like, what would that really do for you? And typically it's always, oh, I would feel better. I would be more confident, but then, then that's what we're, you know, then that's the piece we're missing. We're missing self-confidence. So how do we build self-confidence without being so focused on this number um, for, for virtually, you know, no reason? Um, you can get to that number and still not have that confidence. Been there, done that. Exactly. I felt worse, I felt worse which is, you know. So which is something, I feel like that's something we could totally use more of in, in all these, especially residential facilities. As someone who's gone through things like this and be like, yeah, I've, lost all the weight and I've been the numbers I wanted to be. And I still didn't feel good. I, you know, I was unhappy with that. Um, so I think that's, yeah, it's, it's, there's always little things that I'm thinking, like, I wish we could just plant this younger, especially working with adolescents. That's something I'm trying to do more uh, truthfully that used to the adolescents, the nutrition needs are a little bit different. So it used to be something that I tried to really stay away from, but lately I'm like, you know, why are we letting people get to their, you know, 30s, 40s, thinking this way and then making changes. Like we need to be tackling this at much younger ages so that they're not going through all of this, um, yeah. beating themselves up and poor self-confidence and all that. Yeah. I have a 17, almost 18 year old son and who is a, a, a massive human. He is like a Adonis who's six foot three and like, wow, ch like very, but he ran his whole life. He ran on a little bit of the, you know, Chucky side. He was a big, just always a big boy. You know, yeah. and I've watched him just transform into being much more active and, and, and watching his confidence with how he's eating, educating himself on nutrition, on, on not over exercising. And I always tell him to like listen to his body because I'll be like, babe, if you're if you're falling asleep on the couch right now, your body's telling you you don't need to go meet your friend at the gym. Like you need to take a nap. You know, and trying to teach him those those to pay attention to those cues now. Like, yes, it's great to have goals. It's great to want to, you know. To, to be committed, but like sometimes the commit that what you need the most is to say, no, today I'm not like, I don't, I don't subscribe to that mentality where people like will bully. You. Oh, well, you know, you, you don't, you're, you're taking a, the, the wimpy way out. You're no, I'm listening to my body and I'm honoring myself. And I'll tell you right now at my age, I am very comfortable with telling people mm -hmm. no. It's a complete answer for me. I don't get bullied into like trying to do one. If I doesn't feel right, I'm not going to do one more round of the workout. If it feel like I feel lightheaded, I'm going to listen to myself. But there was a time when that was not the case. I yeah, I can definitely relate to that. Um, I feel like working out's always been my release. Um, I don't think I've ever really sh truly struggled with food. Maybe for a little while in college when I was learning all about nutrition. Um, that can be a weird cycle when you're in a classroom with tons of people that everyone's obviously focused on nutrition and eating, but um, working out has always kind of been a release. So yeah, that CrossFit mentality of, you know, no days off or um, yeah. all, all these things. Yeah. One more rep or, you know, you can always finish this. And um, I think it took for me having kids, actually having children. And I'm like, this, no, <laughs> this is, this doesn't feel good anymore. And I don't want to leave the gym feeling so tired that I can't get through the rest of my day. I used to work out at 5am. It's like, if I left the gym at six o'clock feeling worse than when I got there, I'm like, okay, something's wrong here. Like yeah. this is adding up. So yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's huge. And I think teaching kids that young also, I mean, boys do have it really tough. I think sometimes even more so with the body image, because if they're not the right size, you know, whatever that means. Um, I think there's less camaraderie with males than maybe with females of, you know, an, oh yeah, I understand that, you know, guys aren't maybe as likely to talk about those feelings yeah. with their friends. That's We're girls, maybe more with like your closest group of friends. So I love that, you know, someone that's actually working on body image with males because it's a really big struggle. Um, a lot of, I've had a lot of men share with me over the years and they don't really tell people, they don't talk about it, you know? Um, and so there is a space for you. If you are a male that struggles with body image or eating disorders or any of that, there is help for you out there and you are not alone. I know a, a lot of men that have shared that with me. And a lot more facility, like uh, eating disorder treatment facilities are taking men, which I think is big. For so long, a lot of them didn't. Um, 
which is good to hear. Um, but also just having that support outside, like finding a therapist that you can really relate to and um, a dietitian or, or someone that can help you with eating um, is really big uh, to help them bridge that gap too. Awesome. So uh, as a closing piece, so just kind of like, I know it's such a going to be such a broad question, but like if someone today wants to tr- like get healthier, like what are just a couple things they could do today um, to, to make, to make healthier choices, like without having to change the whole wide world and take on all this stuff or go spend all this money. Like what are a few simple things that individuals can do today to become healthier? Yes, it definitely depends on the person, but I've said it a million times already in the past 45 minutes, but um, consistency, you know, we cannot have these days where, you know, I was busy, so I skipped meals or I ate, you know, one really huge meal at the end of my day because I didn't have time to eat here or there. Um, Keeping those things consistent, like committing to that. Like if you have to write it down, I've had people put alarms in their phones, um, whatever it takes. And eating a meal can look different to everyone. Like if a Greek yogurt and a banana is all you really want for lunch because you're not that hungry, great. I don't care. Like put something in your body. Um, that helps. And, um, and also not, not depriving yourself of what really sounds good. I mean, if you really want spaghetti for dinner, um, have spaghetti with dinner, like have that pasta, have, you know, maybe a a fist size portion and see how you feel. Maybe you need more than that, but let's work it in. Like, let's slow it down and eat mindfully, like be present at that meal to see what you actually need. Um, I like like you said to touch on the the eating slower. That's one thing like I see everybody eats so fast and we're supposed to chew a lot more than, you know, when we do. 15 to 20 times per bite. I was told that once by a GI doctor and that if everyone chewed every bite of their food 15 to 20 times, which is a lot, I've tried it and it feels like (laughs) this is going to take an hour. Right. Um, But he said, he's like, I wouldn't have a job if everyone chewed their food 15 to 20 times a bite because uh, digestion starts in the mouth with, you know, chewing. So if we're able to start it here, then our, the rest of our system has a lot less work to do. Yeah. But, um, any other thing that someone could do today, uh, maybe for the woman that did, that doesn't like to like walk or go to the gym, maybe what would you recommend to her? I would say just randomly pick one, one physical movement activity that you've always wanted to try and you've never had the courage to try before try it and that could be so many things um it does not have to be you know traditional walking jogging going to the gym um i'm trying to think of something kind of different i mean you said you went a long time ago to one of those smash places yeah the smash row i'm going actually friday okay did you feel i've i've heard people tell me they feel like they get like okay oh yeah that's a great example I mean, like going out on a canoe or a kayak, um, you know, if you have kids, taking them to do something and playing with them. Um, Trampoline yeah. parks are big. If you're, if you have kids, that's, that's a great workout. Uh, there are so many ways to move our bodies. And I think we all get stuck that it has to be a gym or a yoga studio or this or that. It can be a million different things. And if you hate it, if you do one, whatever it is, and you're like, wow, that that sucked. That was terrible. Great. Never do it again. Choose something different. Um, I know it's hot right now if you're in South Florida or I guess really the Southeast, but, um, you know, do something inside if you have to, like anything that you can do. um, Sorry, my battery's running low. Um, Anything that you can do to um, move your body and and make yourself feel good is, is a win. Yeah. And if you hate walking, like, you know, the moments, the moods, I don't like to walk. I put on either good music, good podcast, you know, there's so many things we can listen to that can kill that time. Like if we don't really enjoy it, that makes it more enjoyable. Yeah. Or mall walking. If it's too hot. I know um, a lot of the malls around here (laughs) are filled with mall walkers. It's so funny. I used to think that was such a silly thing to do. And then as I've gotten older, I'm like, you know, I wouldn't mind just (laughs) a mall walker around the mall. Like that sounds like a great idea. So thank you so much for, so how can people find you? So I want to be like, how, people can find you on our website, the next level recovery associates website. Nicole's profile is on there, but how can people find you? Um, you know, are you here on LinkedIn? 
I, I am on LinkedIn. That would actually probably be the best way right now to find me, Nicole McLaurin, awesome. on there. Um, I am working on a business Instagram. Um, I do not have a website right now, but um, yes, I'm going to help you next level or, or LinkedIn um, at the time for the time being is best. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time and energy today. Again, I'm Amanda Marino. This is Nicole McLaurin, registered dietitian, talked about you know, mental health and nutrition and eating disorders and substance use disorder and just kind of diet culture and just, you know, healthier mindsets on ways that we can, we can all do better, you know, for ourselves, for our clients, for our children. So thank you so much for, for taking the time today. And I apologize for being late. I had a huge um, tech issue. So thank you for your patience and your time, Nicole. No, no worries. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on and giving me the opportunity to speak. Absolutely. Have a great afternoon. Bye. Thank you.